Good morning, HD Barnes. It is good to be with you once more. Let's pray. Holy Father, in your outrageous grace, please bless us all abundantly this morning by speaking to us clearly through the Spirit-inspired Bible so that we might become more like your Son, Jesus. And we ask this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Well, this morning's reading is from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22 to chapter 3, and verse 9. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments, because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to his will. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. They're the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women, who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Just as Yanez and Yambres opposed Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. They're men of depraved minds, who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. But they will not get very far because... As in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. Today we're looking at the wisdom that the mature and experienced Paul gave to his young disciple Timothy. Timothy was the leader of the church in Ephesus where there were all sorts of difficult people. The title of this talk is A Life in Pursuit of Righteousness. Paul had warned Timothy against false teachers and their heretical teaching in the passage we looked at last week, if you remember 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 14 to 19, because both they and those who listened to them inevitably led unrighteous and ungodly lives. Now in verse 22, Paul showed Timothy the kind of character that he must display. We've had the negative, now we're told the positive. Paul expected Timothy to be orthodox, both in his teaching and his life. Of course, one without the other would be a serious disconnect. Teaching one thing and doing another is hypocrisy of the first order. The word flee in verse 22 literally means to seek safety in flight or escape from physical danger. We recognise how destructive to our souls our sinfulness is. Don't try and come to terms with it. Don't try and give yourself a pass or compare yourself with others. Get away from it as, as far as possible. The word pursue, also in verse 22, means the exact opposite of flee. It means to run after, to chase, to press on, to be in hot pursuit. So we're to run away from the spiritual danger, to escape it, and to run after spiritual good and attain it. In a nutshell, this encapsulates the Christian life. We're to deny ourselves and to follow Christ. We're to put off what belongs to our old life and put on what belongs to our new life. We're to put to death the earthly desires and to set our minds on heavenly things. We're to crucify the flesh and to walk in the spirit. The secret of holiness is the ruthless rejection of the one in combination with the reckless pursuit of the other, which is why this talk is called A Life in Pursuit of Righteousness. Timothy must flee the evil desires of youth. And that's not just sexual lust, although it's obviously included. We all know that those desires last well beyond the youth. But it's things like self-assertiveness, self-indulgence, obstinacy, arrogance and impatience. 
And simultaneously, Timothy must pursue righteousness, faithfulness, love and peace. To live this way, says Paul, is the mark of being an authentic Christian. So let's look at those four characteristics. First, righteousness. It is both our position in Christ, the unearned gift to be adopted as the Father's children, and it is a calling for us to live with all-round integrity of character. Second, faithfulness. This is displaying loyalty to Jesus as our King and to our sisters and brothers in the Father's family. Third, love. This is to be unselfish and kind to everyone, everywhere. And fourth, peace. This is to be determined in our commitment to avoid all unnecessary conflict with others. So with this in mind, Paul advised Timothy in verse 23 that there are many arguments that are foolish and stupid and best avoided. Occasionally they are necessary, as Paul's letters themselves show very clearly, but often, so often, all too often, they are pointless and they, they can drain us of energy and the will to live. One of my many failings is that I absolutely dislike conflict. And I'm very wary of anyone who actually likes conflict. Some people think you have to fight every battle. That is so exhausting. It takes wisdom and experience to know which hill is worth dying on. So I've had to learn not to be so fearful that I fail to stand firm on the issues that are vital proclaiming the undiluted gospel of Jesus Christ, and must stand for that, insisting that the core disciplines of our faith are maintained, I've got to stand for that, and exposing immaturity and heresy, I've got to do that. I've got to learn to do that. Pastors and teachers have to find the balance, because if they don't, they'll be distracted and unable to fill their calling. And what's our calling? It is to rescue people from the errors that have captured them and ensnared them, verses 25 to 26. So the starting point for everyone, all of us, is to assume a humble attitude as the Lord's servant, verse 24. The word translated servant is the Greek word doulos, which means slave. Paul, through his own example, called Timothy and all pastors and leaders to live as a slave of Jesus Christ. As the Lord's servant, we must learn a, a number of skills, such as, verse 24, showing kindness. Be kind to everyone, even the false teachers who are such a pain. Believe me, this is easier said than done. But with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can do it. The Lord's servant must develop the skill of teaching, verse 24, and instructing, verse 25, which convinces and persuades folk. This requires the ability to simplify, to teach slowly in, in bite-sized chunks, gently helping the other person to comprehend the wonderful gospel message of Jesus Christ. The Lord's servant, when they think that they've been wronged or slighted or misunderstood, must not become resentful, verse 24. And many times it's simply a wrong perception or a wrong reading of the situation. But instead of giving the benefit of the doubt or choosing to think the best, immature people with the wrong motivation because they need to prove that they are right immediately and often aggressively charge into the fray. But in such a situation, the wise servant exhibits patience, uh, another skill they had to learn. Patience is a sign of great maturity. It's a fruit of the Spirit, and it is a quality of genuine love. You see, the servant's purpose is not to win arguments, nor to waste time proving that they are right. We have a far higher eternal calling and goal. We want to win souls. The Lord's servant must learn the skill to combine gentleness with firm instruction for those who are misguided. Verse 25, teaching a person who is wrong-headed and misguided in the things of God is no easy matter, believe me. Yet gentleness, which is the absence of any desire to defend oneself, will make the task a lot easier. 
Now I know our gentleness will be misunderstood by some to be weakness. But once you've decided to be a slave of Jesus, it doesn't really matter. And honestly, you don't care. However, we have to be realistic. Despite our every effort and learning all these skills and our willing humility, there is absolutely no guarantee of success. Everyone has the gift of free will to choose to accept or to dismiss the gospel. So we're always totally dependent upon the grace of God. That's why Paul wrote in verse 26, in the hope, or perhaps they will come to their senses. The nature of sinfulness is that our deepest problem is not intellectual, it's the state of our heart. The heart needs a miracle within before the mind can accept what it knows. To come to their senses describes a person coming out of a drunken stupor. Satan makes people drunk with his lies. The Lord's servant's task is to sober them up, to rescue them and to lead them to repentance. Repentance, as you know, is a change of mind, a change of thinking, which allows someone to come to a knowledge of the truth, verse 25, and so delivers them from captivity to the devil, verse 26. So now we come to chapter 3, where Paul, in verse 1, paints a dreadful picture of terrible times in the last days. Paul was describing a time of general, general moral decadence. Now we could well ask, and we should ask, when will these last days be? And the last days is New Testament speak for now. They are the last days because this is the final age of the Lord's purposes before Jesus returns and wraps it all up. Paul is warning Timothy that this is not simply a passing trend that will disappear and not return. On the contrary, it will recur persistently through the story of the church. Difficult seasons are guaranteed to come. Then in verses 2 to 5, Paul mentioned 19 particular sins that will arise in the church. Yes, in the church, not just in the world. Paul was referring to nominal Christians. They, they call themselves Christians. They might well attend church and sing songs, but they're Christian in name only. Verse 5, they have a form of godliness, but they're falsely claiming to be God's people. Paul bluntly told Timothy to have, verse 5 again, nothing to do with such people. It is so confusing to the world when someone claims to be a Christian when they're not. The world doesn't know any better. They understandably take such a claim at face value. So when they see this person's life, language, lifestyle priorities are exactly the same as their own, sometimes actually worse, they naturally assume that Christians are no different to them and then by extension that, they, that following Jesus doesn't change anyone's life, does it? Paul is clear. These people are not Christians who have a slightly different opinion on a small matter. These people are not Christians at all. Claiming to be a Christian, even going through recognised Christian rituals, doesn't make a person a Christian. That can only occur under the conviction of the Holy Spirit when someone chooses to follow Jesus as their only Lord, and when they then willingly live submitted to the Holy Spirit. So Paul warned Timothy in verses 2 to 4 to watch out for the self-centred person. First, they're lovers of themselves. Self-centered, you see. Verse 2. A part of the human disease is that we can think and believe that we are the centre of the universe. We can be a legend in our own lunchtime. Like Narcissus, we can fall in love with our own reflection. We can act like the world revolves around moi, me. My needs, my pain, my troubles, my achievements, my wants, my desires, my likes, my pleasures, my rights. You name it. It's all about me. Of course, the reality for the vast majority of us is that in the love of self category, we generally have a fan club of one. The truth is that all people are desperate to have genuine friends. But some, by insisting on being at the centre, push everyone away. Their need becomes self-defeating. Do you realise that you can make more friends in two months by being genuinely interested in other people 
than you can in two years of trying to get other people interested in you. This statement, lovers of themselves, comes first because it is the centre of the problem. It flies directly in the face of God the Father, who is the giver, who demonstrated his love for others when he so loved the world that he gave his very best, his only son, to die for us all. Lovers of themselves and lovers of money, verse 2. Why do we love money? It's horrible, tatty, smelly, and in itself worthless. Of course, what we love is what we think it provides. We think it provides security, food, shelter, comfort and clothes, luxuries, holidays, cars, computers, electronic gadgets, clothes, accessories, houses, healthcare and sparkly things. Status. For some utterly illogical reason, we admire and defer to those who have money, which is very odd and very peculiar behaviour. And happiness. To have and enjoy all I need and want. So people love money, which is why the lottery is so popular. Instant security, luxury, status and happiness. But money doesn't love people. It's neutral. Nor do the things we buy love us. Our our, our love is simply not reciprocated. You know, I'm always deeply hurt and offended whenever we return home from a vacation. Can you believe this? Not once has my furniture, my computer, my coffee machine or my TV said to me, we missed you so much, Pete. Welcome home. The problem, as we all know, or soon will discover, is that money can't buy the really important things of life. A survey of students in London found that the biggest problems they faced was loneliness. Money can't buy you true friends. A US psychological magazine surveyed its readers with this question. Given one wish in life, what would you ask for? They published the results, stating, given one wish in life, most people would choose to be loved. Money can't buy love. Or money can buy the most wonderful house in Barnes, but money can't and won't make it a home. And don't be fooled, money can solve your conscience as you give some away. It can even buy you a crucifix to hang around your neck or on the wall. But money cannot, and it will never be able to buy you a saviour, the one who can deal with the sin of your selfishness. Lovers of themselves and lovers of money. From these two, the rest of the list unravels. Verse too boastful, to brag about, guess who? Oneself. Isn't such a person an incredible bore? Bending your ear with their achievements. whoop de doo Paul wrote that he would never boast in himself, but only in the cross, the death of Christ Jesus. He knew that there should be no glory for the individual. For in Christianity, only one person is entitled to and receives the glory, and that is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we could go on through this list of selfishness which epitomises our society and which has tainted the church too. Paul wanted Timothy to learn how to discern the religious, that is this nominal Christian, from the spirit-filled, that is the child of the Father. There will be some who have an outward appearance of religion but not true Christian faith. Verse 5, having a form of godliness but denying its power. These people have never experienced the power of God in their lives. I remember reading that someone had called out roadside assistance to deal with their car, which wouldn't start. And when the mechanic arrived and he opened the hood, the the bonnet, he discovered that the engine had been stolen. The car looked great, but its inner source of power was missing. Form without power is an outward show without an inward reality. It's religion without relationship. It's love without action. It's teaching without application. It's singing without worship. It's giving without generosity. It's it's prayer without compassion. It's presence without engagement. It's spirituality without morality. It's information without transformation. And it's Christianity without Jesus. There are a few things sadder, emptier and more frustrating than a life of outward religion which isn't powered by the inward dynamic of the Holy Spirit. 
For it is the Holy Spirit who is the power behind changed lives through his fruit maturing in us. It is the Holy Spirit who pours God's love and acceptance into our hearts and enables us to love God and others too. It is the Holy Spirit who makes us holy, who turns our selfishness into selflessness. It is the same Holy Spirit who equips us to do the work of the kingdom of God with faith and endurance. Anything other than a complete reliance upon the Holy Spirit will be ineffective. This is the choice we all face. Will we be outwardly religious or will we be inwardly renewed by the Spirit? Now, the first is easy. The second is costly. The first makes no demands, but the second demands everything. The first assures you that you are a good person. The second reassures you that you are a forgiven sinner. The first is possible in your own strength, but the second is impossible without being filled with the Holy Spirit every single day. Timothy also needed to learn how to discern between the counterfeit and the real thing, verses 6 through 9. Yanes and Yambres are thought to have been the magicians who opposed Moses before Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 7 and following. They tried to imitate God's miracles, by their, but their power was limited. Satan is an imitator. What God does, Satan counterfeits. So we're warned here that there will be those who count with counterfeit beliefs, whose purpose will be to promote a lie and resist the truth of God's word. How will they do this? They will, and they do, deny the authority of the Bible. And in its place, they will substitute human wisdom and philosophy. So, for example, some deny the reality of our sinful nature and everyone's need for salvation. The word Paul used here to describe them is depraved, or more literally, reprobate, meaning tested and found counterfeit. God, who knows their motives, will reject them. Verse 8 is actually in the present tense. It means that they are already rejected. For a while, false teachers can seem to be doing rather well. It may seem that they will overwhelm the church, but the good news is that they will not succeed in the end. God has set a limit to their bad influence. Verse 9, they will not get very far because their folly will be clear and obvious to everyone. Ultimately, false teaching always fails because it is unable to change people's lives in any beneficial and meaningful way. However, the false teaching does do damage while it lasts. It reduces the joy and effectiveness of God's people and it hinders evangelism. Up until about three years ago, we were living in the age of tolerance, which was centered on the principle that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you are sincere. That's nonsense has permeated into the church and has infected many parts of it. It's nonsense because you can be very sincere and still very wrong. As a society, we've now moved from the age of tolerance and we now live in a dreadful time, the cancel culture, where anyone who holds a different opinion to you is no longer tolerated, they're simply cancelled. We've yet to see how this will play out, but it is very concerning and extremely dangerous because it does not allow for debate or discussion for facts to be presented or refuted or for there to be universally accepted truths. How can we discern who these counterfeiting people are? A clear sign is that they oppose the truth. Verse 8. Belief and behaviour go hand in hand. For the believer, truth is vital, not as an end in itself, but because our understanding of it will radically affect how we live. It really does matter what we believe. Jesus told his disciples three significant things about the truth. First, John 14, verse 6, that he, Jesus, is the truth. Second, John 16, verse 3, that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. And third, John 8, 32, that when we know, which means when we understand and live by the truth, that is when the truth will set us free. That's when we'll find freedom. So what should be our attitude to such people? Well, the same as God's. Whilst Paul counseled Timothy, verse 5, to have nothing to do with such people, this does not mean that we are to avoid all contact. 
Jesus himself was a friend of sinners. We're not to copy them. We're not to encourage their activity. We're not to follow them, nor are we to be influenced by them. We're to clearly teach and practice the word of truth, the Bible. We're to avoid their error, but we're not to avoid them. We are to love them and pray for them and share the truth of the gospel of grace with them. So let's pray together. Dear Father, we pray that you would preserve us, your church, from empty professions of faith and lives that deny the truth. Please forgive us for being more concerned with outward appearances than with inner godliness. Lord Jesus, today we choose to follow you. As we learn and live in your truth, may we be set free from lies and falseness. And may our holy behaviour and attitude draw many to want to follow you as their Lord. Holy Spirit, please fill us afresh this morning and change our hearts and minds so that we are empowered to pursue lives of righteousness, faith, love and peace. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all again so much for listening and I pray you have a wonderful week. God bless you.